Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Erin Farley. I'm one of JRSA's research associates. Uh, for those of you who are less familiar uh, of uh, JRSA, it stands for the Justice Research and Statistics Association. We are a national nonprofit organization dedicated to the use of research and analysis to inform criminal and juvenile justice decision making. And we are comprised of a network of researchers and practitioners, which at the core includes directors and staff from state statistical analysis centers. It is my pleasure today to welcome you to our webinar um, regarding logistic regression. It will be presented by Sean Flower and Dan O'Connell. Dan is a scientist with the Center um, for Drug and Health Studies and also teaches criminology at the University of Delaware. His research specialties are research design, methodologies, intervention development, and project management. Sean Flower is a research associate at JRSA and is also the principal researcher of Just, uh, Choice Research Associates, focusing on issues of prisoner reentry, female offenders, community corrections, and program evaluations that employ rigorous methodologies. So welcome. And before we go any further, I would like to thank our partners at the Bureau of Justice Statistics for helping to make this webinar possible. I would also like to cover a few logistical points. So we are recording today's session for future playback. The link to this recording and PowerPoint slides will be posted on JRSA's website, and it's usually posted the following day. Today's webinar is being audio cast via both speakers on your computer and teleconference. So it, as you logged in, you probably received a prompt regarding this. Uh, we recommend listening to the webinar using your computer speakers or headphones. To access the audio conference, if there are any issues, you can access the audio conference by selecting audio from the top menu bar and then select audio conference and it should prompt you just follow the instructions. Um, and if you do continue to have any problems, please reach out to Jason Trask at jtrask at, email, uh, at jrsa org. In the last five minutes of today's webinar, we will ask you to complete a short survey the information you provide will help us to plan and improve future webinars and to meet our reporting requirements. Um, all telephones have been muted, so if you would like to ask a question, please use the chat feature unless otherwise instructed otherwise. Um, and please remember to select host, and that will go to um, Jason and or myself, and we will share it with the presenters. So at this time, I'm going to pass this over to Dan, and he is going to take it from here. So Dan, it's, I think the little uh, magic ball is now next to your name, and you got it. So go ahead. Excellent. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, welcome, everybody. So we're here today about logistic regression. Um, and what, what we're going to do, if you see the overview slides, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing. Uh, no questions, not data, and then the process. Uh, we'll want to start simple, work our way up, uh, uh, and at the end, we're going to uh, encourage all of you to try this at home. I see we have 44 attendees uh, on, on the conference. I'm going to try to move through this fairly briskly, uh, and I'd like to remind everybody uh, we're doing. Uh, we're getting. I'm getting a lot of feedback. Any from um, somebody has an open microphone. If they could close it, it would be useful. Uh, yes, hi Dan. Yes, we're seeing that there is a. Uh, yeah, there's a little bit of noise. So if that's not you, um, everybody should be muted. But let me just double check. I'm not, okay. are you hearing, are you hearing anything? I'm not hearing anything right now. I'm not hearing anything now. Okay, okay, well, um, okay. Off we go. All right. Um, so at the outset, what I want to do is, is, is point out 
uh, that we're covering logistic regression, a pretty a pretty advanced topic in in many ways uh, in a one hour webinar. Uh, so what we want to do is encourage you to uh, utilize resources uh, and 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 you know your best resources are the people around you, JSRA and uh, uh, and the community at large. So we're going to do logistic regression basics. Uh, um, so with that, why are we here? Uh, you know, people were often asked to to report on programs, uh, whether it's a treatment program, a reentry program, uh, whatever the case may be. Uh, and we want to we want to be right, and we want to we want to be confident in in the answers that we give to people. We want to be able to back them up. Um, so we want to be able to run uh, statistics with 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 the, where we can predict a degree of certainty on things. And we also want to be able to present those to general audiences so that they'll uh, be able to, to understand what we're talking about. Um, you know, generally a presentation given by a room full of statisticians. Uh, can be incomprehensible to people who are not statisticians. So it's key to key to keep in front of us uh, that, that that this all needs to be presented in a meaningful way. And we'll we'll, we'll go through some of how to do that. Um, so what are we doing? Um, we're going to provide information on how to move from a question, a yes or no question, more on that, uh, to an analysis and to reporting. So what you should walk away from this is. Um, the ty types of questions that logistic regression is appropriate to answer. Basically, anything that can be answered in a yes-no way. Did an event occur? Did an event not occur? That's a yes-no question. Uh, and it sets us up for odds ratios down the road. Uh, we'll talk about the required data parameters, do a, do a run-through of how to, how to run a model. I use the statistical package SPSS, so I'll be showing some examples in that. Uh, but you can run these things in STATA, R, SAS, uh, whatever uh, your, your program of preference is. We'll talk about interpretation, uh, especially interpretation of odds ratios, because that is the main thing that uh, comes out of logistic regression. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about really understanding what's going on in an odds ratio, because these numbers are often thrown out uh, without a firm understanding about what they are and what's underneath them. Uh, then Sean's going to take over and talk about how to put this information and use what's known as a predicted probability. Uh, and I will allow her to talk about that. Uh, and all the way through, we're going to talk about how to explain this to a general audience. Um, so, okay, understanding yes and no questions. Not everything is suitable for a logistic request for, uh, regression. Um, a time to failure is not a logistic regression uh, model, you know, the number of days for something uh, occurring. Uh, any, any linear kind of numeric outcome like that would be a linear regression or some other method. The rule of thumb we use for logistic regression is, is it a yes, no? Did you violate a patrol term, parole term or not? Did you present at court or not? And often uh, in the criminal justice field, it's some measure of recidivism or didn't or not. So was the person rearrested? Was the person reconvicted? Was the person reincarcerated or not? Those can all be framed as yes, no, or for statistical purposes, zero, one questions, with zero being no, yes being uh, one. Uh, but I'll show you some tricks, and, and sometimes you want to flip those. Um, so moving down, this is just more on the same. If, you're, if, you're, if your outcome variable is, is, is like the top line there, the observed variable is linear, um, that means it goes up in some kind of uh, linear way. Uh, you would want to use linear regression or some other method. But if you have a yes-no uh, variable where the predicted value of X in this case, you know, you have, if you look at the slide there, the no's are all on the left, and then we, we see the increase to the yeses on the right. That's when we want to employ logistic regression. All right. So that's when to use it. So what are we doing? We have to start, of course, with data. Um, now, logistic regression is not as picky as linear regression. It doesn't uh, make some of the key assumptions about ordinary least square, squares algorithms, such as linearity, normality, homo homoscedasticity, uh, and measurement level. Um, what it does require are binary and independent outcomes, zero, one outcomes. It prefers binary predictors. 
um, such as was person enrolled in program or not? Uh, is the person a male or female? Is the person a uh, minority or white? Those types of things. And that's largely for interpretation. The model itself doesn't care. Um, but if you put in something like a linear variable such as age into a logistic regression, you'll often see an outcome variable. As a matter of fact, we might have this in this example, uh, where you have a significant odds ratio, but your odds ratio is 1.07 or something like that. Um, that is difficult to interpret. Um, so the yes, no ones, uh, and we'll see this as we go, uh, are much easier to uh, in, in, interpret. Our, our predictor variables, we want them to be reasonably uncorrelated, generally a, a correlation coefficient of lower than 0.8. Um, and those are kind of diagnostic things that we won't get into much on this today, uh, but any good statistics manual will have something on that and how to run those. Um, so sample size, uh, logistic regression likes reasonably large samples. Uh, a general rule of thumb for logistic regressions is you want 30 cases for each predictor. Um, so if you're just doing a one variable, well, if you're doing a zero variable model, you could have 30, but that's not recommended. But So for a four variable model, so say we're predicting a rest and we have four variables, uh, maybe that's gender, age, race and treatment participation, right? So we would want 30 cases for each added predictor. So we would want then uh, 120 for a very a four variable model. If we add predictors, we would like that sample to go up. Um, so for all regression models, valid predictors should be included and only valid predictors should be included. That's just a statistical rule of thumb. You don't want to throw a bunch of unnecessary variables into a model because uh, it dilutes the influence uh, of each one. Um, so starting simple. So presume you have your data set. You, you're, you're doing a program evaluation or you're doing a recidivism report for somebody and you've got the data. Um, we want to start really simple. I, I, I tell my students, you know, get to know your data. Play with your data. Uh, so you should never start right in with the logistic regression. That's, that's kind of the end of the road, if you will. Um, we want to start with descriptives and frequencies of variables. You know, frequencies means distribution of both the outcomes uh, and, the, uh, and the predictors. If it's a linear variable, uh, look for outliers, because outliers are always a problem in logistic in any kind of regression because uh, the, the equation will try to grab the outlier and it can skew your results. Um, and when we're doing frequencies, means, and things like that, uh, we want to make sure everything's, everything's uh, what we're expecting to see. Uh, I've, I've done a lot of data analysis in the past, and you'll pull down a data set or you'll get a data set from somebody, uh, and you have, uh, let's say, for example, male, female, zero, one, and you run a frequency and you've got zero, one, and three. Um, you know, you've got a couple cases in some, some weird category. And, and then you need to go back and do some data cleaning prior to any uh, analysis. If a variable is supposed to be zero, 01, everything in that variable should be zero, 01. Uh, and if you can't correct it, you need to set it to missing. Um, so we start with descriptives. Uh, then we move to, to, to bivariate analyses, cross tabs, T cross tabs for categorical variables, T tests for linear variables. Uh, and then we uh, move to, to regressions. <laughs> what we're going to do next is use an example uh, from a data set uh, and, and, and just kind of walk you through this process from beginning to end, all right? <laughs> so we're using data from a probation-based treatment program. Uh, and the question was, was the program effective in reducing recidivism? Uh, recidivism in this case, just for this example, we're going to use arrested for a new crime, which will be coded as one, or not, which is coded as zero. So that's a yes, no question turned into a one or a zero. The sample consisted of 400 people, 200 people in each group. Uh, we had background or predictor characteristic variables of race, gender, age, and age at first arrest. Uh, which we used uh, as a measure of criminal propensity, um, which, by the way, is an incredibly robust uh, measure of criminal propensity. It's a simple one to use uh, and a lot easier to capture than some of the others. Um, 
Just for the record, real quick, I did notice looking at the attendees that Jim Salt is on this call from the Delaware SAC. And uh, hi, Jim, and thanks for the data. Um, so we get the data, you get your data set, and you want to start playing with your data. So in this case, um, we start with the frequencies. So what we've done here, uh, I'll run frequencies of our uh, outcome and uh, key predictor variables, our categorical variables here. The code that you see on the right uh, is SPSS syntax code. We're going to post this data set online at the end of the webinar. Uh, well, at some point, it may be a week or two before it shows up. Essentially, if you were to copy that code and paste it into an SPSS syntax window, it would produce these tables. Um, so just looking at it, you can see going down the table at the top, we have condition, um, standard probation treatment program, 200 people in each group. There's no strange codes there. Everybody's where they belong. Uh, the outcome variable, arrested for a new crime, we see that 170 people, or 42%, were not arrested. 56% uh, or 226 people uh, were arrested. You see in there, and this is why you check data, uh, there are four people that are system missing on that. Uh, basically, for this study, there were four people that uh, absconded before the study started, uh, so they were kind of removed. But that's, that's more than we need to know for this. Uh, you can see that the sample is 54% uh, black uh, and 46% white, 15% female, and 85% uh, male. Um, so we've got a we got a feeling for kind of who's in our program here, uh, and who's going to be in our analysis. The next table uh, are the descriptives. These are for the linear variables. Um, so we have a start age, uh, and start age would be enrollment into the program. It was in an adult uh, probation department, and the minimum age of the of clients was 18 years old. Uh, the maximum 58, and there we see the mean standard deviations. Uh, and then again, first adult arrest, we see those as well. Uh, so we're just working our way up through here, kind of getting to know our data. Um, then we move to the next level, which are bivariate cross tabs. Uh, and you can see there, uh, we have the standard probation and the treatment program variable. That's really what we're interested in. Did the program produce better outcomes? Um, and you see uh, the outcome variable there on the right, not arrested or arrested. Uh, we see in the standard probation group, 70% of the group was uh, rearrested, uh, and in the treatment program, 44% uh, of the group uh, were rearrested. Uh, you see the Pearson. I'm not going to get into the chi squared statistics, but you see that they're all uh, uh, essentially 0.0. Um, so we have significant differences at the bivariate level. Um, most people are not going to want to see this table. Uh, if you're submitting to a report or a journal, you would want this. Uh, but for a general audience, uh, you take that same data and produce a table that is much more easier to interpret. Um, so 70% in the standard group rearrested, 44 uh, were arrested. Um, so that's taking the frequencies, getting to know our data, starting with uh, the simple kind of stuff, bivariate cross tabs to give us, uh, give us uh, a look at what's going on. Let me go back a slide. So we already know at the bivariate level that the treatment program is having an impact. Um, so that's telling us a lot right there in that slide. Uh, where aggression comes in is we want to know is if we control from things for things such as race, gender, age, uh, or whatever it, it may be of interest, you know, uh, does that impact the effect that we're seeing here? Um, you know, in a, in a, in a Statistics class, basically, we like to say that what you find at the bivariate level, in some ways, uh, you see whether it holds up uh, under a multivariate analysis. So um, so what are we doing? We're going to, here we go, logistic regression. All right, so our outcome is binary. We know that, arrest, not arrest. Uh, and the purpose of the analysis, then, is to assess the effect of explanatory variables, which can be numeric and or categorical uh, on the outcome. So. Uh, here's what we need to be specified. We need an outcome variable with two categorical outcomes, one success, zero. Uh, then we're going to estimate the probability of P uh, for the outcome variable. We're going to link that to the explanatory variables, and we're going to estimate the coefficients of the equation and test the goodness of fit. Um, so 
before we jump right into the, 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 the model, though, we need to understand what a logistic regression is doing. It's all about probabilities and odds. It's the probability of an event occurring versus the probability of an event not occurring, which gets us to what's called an odds ratio, which is the odds of an event occurring or not. And I'm going to – I'll walk you through this. Um, so a probability of an outcome is the odds of the occurrence. Uh, and then the odds, the probability of it not occurring uh, is 1 minus P. So the odds of success is P. Uh, the odds of it not occurring uh, are P. Uh, and so we get a P, 1 minus P. Let me jump to the next slide to see if I can make this make a little bit more. Actually, it'll be the one after that. So there's the logistic regression uh, equation up there at the top. We have an outcome variable. Uh, we have a baseline, uh, a constant. Uh, and then we have a series of predictors, beta 1, x1, beta 1. Uh, so alpha represents the overall risk, the constant. Uh, the constant in a, in a logistic regression model uh, is the probability of an event, uh, the, mean, the mean probability of the event. Uh, and then b1 and b2 uh, represent the fraction by which rear s is, in this case, uh, is altered by a unit change in X1, the same true for X2, and so on. You could, you could do this uh, out quite a ways. What's changing are the log odds. Um, the odds themselves are changed by the equation there. So if beta equals 1.6, the odds are e to 1.6 or 4.95. Uh, and, and I'll explain uh, this, this, this below. Um, for the record, it is really useful to grab a calculator and go through what I'm presenting here. Not now, uh, but at some point, if, if you grab a calculator and you go through and you do this yourself and walk through it, you will really get an intuitive sense of what these models are doing. Uh, I'm going to walk you through it here uh, and, and, and lead you up to, to an odds ratio. All right. So probabilities range from 0 to 1. So let's say the probability of success is 0.8. Uh, thus, P equals 0.8. Simple. Then the probability of failure is Q, which is 1 minus P, 0.2. Bear with me, folks. Odds are determined from probabilities. They range not between 0 and 1, but between 0 and infinity. Odds are the ratio of the probability of success and the probability of failure. So the odds of success uh, can be defined as P divided by 1 over P, or P over Q. Or, to go back to the top, 8 over 0.8 over 0.2 equals 4. So the odds of success for the, for, for the thing given above, where the probability of success is 0.8, and therefore the probability of failure is 0.2, are 4 to 1. Okay? The odds of... Uh, uh, failure would be the opposite of that. If you do 0.2 divided by 0.8, you get 0.25, which is 1 in 4. So the next step, the odds of success and the odds of failure are just reciprocals of one another. They go back and forth. Uh, and this is what I mean. It's really useful to get a calculator and play with this so you see how this is really working. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, you'll really get an understanding. I know back in graduate school, they made us do this with calculators forever. By the end of it, you really kind of had a feel for what was going on. So to put this into a real example here, um, suppose we had 7 out of 10 males rearrested, uh, while 3 out of 10 uh, females are rearrested. Then the probabilities for arresting a male are 7 divided by 10 equals 0.7, and Q, the probability um, – of uh, a female being arrested would be uh, 1 minus 7, okay, so 0.3. So if you're a male, the probability of being rearrested is 0.7, and the probability of not being rearrested is 0.3. They are the inverse. Uh, here are the same for, for, for females, okay? So P, uh, if uh, we said 3 out of 10 females were rearrested, that's 3 divided by 10 equals 0.3. And then Q, the probability of not being arrested, is 1 minus uh, P, which is 0.3 or 0.7. So if you're female, it turns out to be the opposite. The probability of being rearrested is 0.3. 
probability of not being rearrested, 0.7. Okay, that gives us our probabilities. Now we want to take the next step and use those to compute the odds of rearrest for each. Uh, so the odds of rearrest are, are the division of the inverses there, 0.7 divided by 0.3 uh, for males and 0.3 divided by 0.7 uh, for the females. And so you see the odds there for males are, are uh, are 2.3 uh, for males and 0.43 essentially uh, for the female. Now this is where the odds ratio comes in. It is the odds between the two. So the odds of uh, rearrest for the males divided by the odds of rearrest for a female, uh, and you see them there on the slides, would be 5.44. Thus for a male, the odds of being rearrested are 5.44 four times greater than the odds of being rearrested. Everybody take a breath, including me, all right? So why I say it's good to do this with a calculator and to intuitively kind of understand it, when you run a logistic regression in SPSS or SATA or R, you know, you're gonna get the table, I'm gonna show, you, show them to you here in a minute. All you're gonna see in that table is that 0.544. And generally what we say is, say, okay, the odds of being rearrested are 0.54 for males over females. Um, but as, as a presenter or somebody that's, that's running these kind of analyses, it is quite useful to, to kind of understand the math. And it's simple. It's division. It's a series of, multi, of, of divisions and uh, um, to kind of get the underlying what's happening in those odd ratios um, will make you much more confident in just, just what you're talking about in general. Um, so. Let's go to the software. Um, so this is an SPSS example, uh, and I'm going to show you the, the, the drop, uh, the window drop-down boxes. Uh, I've also pasted into the slides there the SPSS syntax, uh, which is the syntax that will run all of the tables that are in this presentation. So uh, once we get the, the data up, if you want to pull this down with it, so you can have the data and and the presentation, you can you can kind of walk through it and and see if you're reproducing things in the same way. Uh, and interpreting them uh, then in the same way. So you see the, the basic drop-down menus there under analyze, under regression, se selecting binary logistic. Um, and other programs have the same things. We're not going to go through all of the programs. I, I work a lot in SPSS. I know other people uh, do different things. But, uh, you know, uh, so if you're in STATA or if you're in R, uh, you, you, you can do similar things or, or and certainly write the code. Um, so we, uh, I'm, again, I'm using the SPSS example. We select the dependent variable, and then we put in the, to the block the, uh, the conditions. Um, uh, what I do and what I, what I tell others to do is rather than just hit OK and running it, uh, to hit paste, and uh, it'll paste that uh, syntax right into a syntax window, and then I run the syntax um, because uh, then I know what I've done, essentially. If I go back to it, I have it right there. Because often you'll, 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 you may tweak models, add a variable, take a variable out. Um, and doing that uh, in the syntax way is a little more simple. So <laughs> you go back. So that syntax or that point and click method produces these results. So we'll just kind of walk through this. Uh, we get the, the basic case processing summary. We want to make sure all the cases are here. We're losing five cases in this particular instance. We know we're losing those five, so we're okay with that. But we've got 395 people in the analysis. Um, you always want to make sure you're coding the variable in the right direction. Uh, so we know that not arrested is zero and arrested is one in this instance, uh, because that's going to frame the interpretation of all of the output, the, the odds ratios that we're looking at are, are going to be based on that. So. We just kind of want to make sure we're, 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 we're predicting what we think we're predicting. Um, we then get a classification table. Uh, and, and there's two things you look at for model fit in, 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 in a logistic regressions. We'll, we'll look at the, the R squareds, and there's, there's big debates in the statistical journals about how to interpret those, whether they're valid. Uh, we're not going to get into those here, because uh, basically what people do is use them. But another thing that people often don't use is the way uh, your classification is improving from the baseline model to, to the model you have. Um, so without going too much into it, because I see it's only 130, already 130, what we see here is that 
the model with no variables in it, this is the beginning block, okay? So oh, that's putting nothing into the model and just running a model with the outcome arrest variable. Having no predictors, we're predicting 57% of cases correctly. Uh, and what SPSS is doing, it's predicting that everybody's gonna get rearrested, and it comes, so what it gets is it, it gets 57% uh, of the cases uh, uh, correct. Um, I'm not going to show all of the other stuff from the, the, the entry block model. I'm going to move to the, to, to the final model, which is our model with predictors. Um, so we get a number of things here. We get a, com, a chi squared test uh, of, for all of the coefficients, and we see that is significant. So we're entering all the variables at once. That's the first arrow there. Uh, our model is significantly better than the one with no predictors. That's what that first tell it. Uh, table up there is telling us. Uh, I'll jump down in a minute. The model summary with the R squared is uh, if you're interpreting the R squared, we generally use the nagel kirke R squared in a logistic regression. Uh, and what it is, we're, per, we're, we're predicting 10% of the variance in the outcome variable uh, in this model. Is that good? Is that bad? Uh, again, statisticians will, will, will argue about uh, the strength of an R squared. But what we do see also is we've increased our ability to predict uh, a little bit better than we had in the initial model. Uh, we're up to 63% over 57%. Uh, so we're doing a better job at, at, at predicting the outcome variable. So most of that stuff nobody looks at. Everybody jumps right to this table. This is the variables in the equation table. This is the outcome. This is what everybody wants to know. Uh, and again, we're predicting the likelihood of real rest, that's our zero one variable, uh, based on these predictor variables. Um, so while the columns with the betas, the standard errors, and the walls are, are of interest, um, Mostly what we're looking at here are those X, EXPB, the exponentiated beta and the significance. Because um, the exponentiated beta there, that is the odds ratios. Um, so SIG is telling us the significance, the second one from the, from the right there is telling us whether those are significant uh, and that they're not due to chance. So you see in this model, we really only have one significant variable and that is the condition variable. Uh, so what that tells us is that when controlling for all other factors, uh, age at first arrest, age at entry into the program, race and gender uh, had no significant impact uh, on the outcome controlling for everything else. Um, so looking down at the exponentiated beta, um, uh, we see that the, 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 the exponentiated beta, the odds ratio for the program participation is 0.325. I've got a typo in there. It's not 0.304, it's 0.325. Um, so what does that mean? Um, it means the odds of someone in the program being rearrested are 0.304 what they are for those not in the program, uh, controlling for all ever other variables. Now, if you're speaking to a general audience, uh, negative odds ratios, and by negative in this, we mean uh, below one, uh, because odds ratios above one uh, are increasing the likelihood of something happening. Odds ratios below one are decreasing the odds of something occurring. Um, so when we get an odds ratio such as uh, 0.304, let's just call it 0.3. Um, so the odds of someone in the program being arrested are 0.3 what they are for those not in the program. This gets a little confusing. Um, and there's a lot of debate out there actually how to interpret a negative odds ratio. What I, the statistician, like to do uh, is take the inverse. Uh, and so if I do one divided by 0.3, uh, I get 302. And that's how you take the inverse of an odds ratio. That means my exponentiated beta is now 3.2. Thus, the odds and the interpretation of that are the odds of someone 
not in the program getting arrested are 3.2 uh, times the odds of someone not in the program controlling for the other variable. That is intuitively a lot simpler for people to understand than saying 0 0.304. Um, so to just reiterate that again, a negative odds, were, and this is just my recommendation, this is not, you know, your mileage may vary, as they say. Uh, if you get a negative odds ratio that's significant and you're, you're presenting to, to, to an audience, uh, it is often easier to take the inverse of that negative odds ratio and present, prevent, present it uh, in the inverse. So, and the inverse, if we're presenting um, the 0 .304 are the odds of someone in the program. If we mathematically take the inverse by doing one divided by 0 .304, flipping it and getting that 0 .302, we've taken the inverse of people not uh, people in the program not getting arrested. Um, so the odds of people not in the program or someone in the program not getting arrested. Sorry, I flipped. <laughs> uh, the odds of someone not in the in the program not being arrested were 3.2 odds. Uh, times the odds of someone in the program uh, controlling for the other variable. Sorry if I confused you. That uh, I'm hoping this is making sense. And uh, again, if you, if, if at a later point you grab the slides and and get a calculator and kind of work back through this, uh, I think this will make a lot more sense to you. Uh, Andy, yes. This is Aaron. I just want to um, make you aware of time. It's about 1:40 almost. Okay, good. I'm almost done. Um, I kind of talk about it. I'm famous for talking ahead of my slides. Uh, the other way you can do that, what I just said, is to flip the variable in the model by recoding it. Um, so we had program participation coded as 0, 1. Uh, if you recode your variable so that 1 is people not in the Since Since I was just reading the chat, somebody had a question there, but we'll get to that at the end. So if you reflip it to be not in the program and then rerun the model, um, you get the same uh, log, logs, uh, log odds ratio over there in the exponentiated beta, which you can see. Uh, and by flipping that, you see those the odds of those not being in the program being rearrested uh, were three point time one times that of the program participant. Uh, I encourage you to walk back through this uh, when you have more time because I'm kind of rushing through of it because we're kind of covering a lot of stuff. So. Uh, here are some st syntax examples uh, uh, that, I, that I've given you. Um, there's one for Stata. Uh, but I'd like to remind you that, uh, you know, your colleagues, and yes, folks, Google can help. Uh, there are many uh, forums on Google where you can post questions and find uh, examples of how to run models. Uh, if you post something up there, a lot of folks, folks will help you out. So. In sum, the, the logistic regression is a valuable tool to be used when determining yes-no questions. Uh, I again stress, start with the basics. Never go right to a logistic regression. Work your way to it. Uh, the models are not hard to run. They are simple to run. They are tricky to interpret. Um, and I encourage people to, uh, again, to go back through this and, and take a closer look at it. Uh, so that you really understand uh, what, what we were doing in that example that I very quickly ran through. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Sean now, who is going to show you uh, how to take what we just talked about and, and use it to do what is known as uh, predicted probability. So, Aaron, I'm going to be quiet and turn it over to Sean. Thank you very much, Dan. I am just taking control of the webinar now, and then we're going to be kicking it back to you to conclude up, and then we'll take some questions. Um, one second, please. Okay. Um, okay. So, Dan, I might have to ask you to move the slides for me for just a moment. Um, from our logit model, from our, uh, we can then estimate the probability of an event occurring while holding the other factors constant. And this is actually much easier, I think, to explain to that general audience and even sometimes the odds ratios. Uh, I certainly get tongue-tied. Uh, when I try to explain an odds ratio to folks. Um, the basic formula for uh, the predicted probabilities, or p hat, is the exponential values of the intercept uh, and the coefficients, and then divided by one plus the exponential of the, of the uh, intercept and the, co the coefficients. Um, we'll talk first about how to calculate these by hand, 
And then we'll provide resources on how you can do this using, um, I particularly like Stata, um, and I'll explain why, but also some other tricks for SPSS. Dan, can you go to the next slide for me, please? Thank you. Um, in order to calculate the probabilities by hand, you'll need to use the unstandardized beta coefficients that you get in your, in your logit um, output. You'll also need the means of your, um, of your variables um, in order to plug it into the spreadsheet. Uh, we have provided a, we will provide a spreadsheet that will use this exact example that you can see how the formulas that we use to calculate the predictive probability. Uh, Dan, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, so you'll see on this spreadsheet, on this slide here, you'll see on this slide here that um, we, it's really, really simple. You take the, the beta coefficient and the mean and you simply multiply those for the whole equation, each item. And then you take, you sum up that column. So in this case, all of the coefficients multiplied by the means totals 0.310. Then you, you do the exponential of that value, which is 0.734, and then 1 over 1 plus the exponentiated value is 0.577. That is actually the predictive probability of someone being arrested holding the other variables constant. It really is sort of straightforward as that. Dan, can you go to the next slide for me, please? Thank you. I also wanted to look at help, uh, a predicted probability for a specific group of folks, um, such as by race, and then we'll talk about by gender. Um, in order to do this, in this case, race was coded as 1 equals white. And to do this, again, in your spreadsheet, and I, I included these columns, uh, what you would do is you would, for those that you want to isolate that are black and you want to get their predicted probability, of being rearrested, you would you would set the coefficient for race as zero, and then you would then do the same calculations you did before, summing the columns, doing the exponential, and dividing that to get your predicted probability. So in this column, you'll see at the very bottom that the predicted probability for those who are black and controlling for other factors in the model of rearrest is 55%. Likewise, for those who are white, um, you, you hear because 1 equals white, you're actually just going to in, include the, the straight up beta coefficient, not the beta times the mean, just the straight beta coefficient in the column to account for those who are white. And there you see when you run through those equations again, the predicted probability of those who are white to be rearrested is about 6.606 6 or 61%. Can we see the next slide, Dan? Thanks. Same exact process here. Um, again, because here, race, uh, sorry, gender is coded one as male. For those that you're trying to look at males in this sample, uh, you would include the straight beta, the unstandardized beta coefficient um, in, the, in the columns. And then your predicted probability for, the, for those who are male is 0.58458%, holding other factors into account. And then for the females, again, you would zero it out and simply calculate it without, uh, with it set at zero, and the predicted probability of women for arrest in this program controlling for the program participation, age at first arrest, the age they started the program, and race was 55%. Next slide. <clears throat> There also is a nice uh, write-up. There's actually a, really, a lot of really good materials on the web that um, you can find by searching, but one in particular um, that I thought was helpful actually shows you sort of the, the cross-nature the cross nature of race and gender. So you, it shows you how to calculate for the predictive probability of black males and black females and white males and white females. Um, this is a, this is a um, uh, link to that particular paper. And within that paper, there is actually um, a link to a spreadsheet. They also have a nice graph showing um, how you can sort of, in a histogram, show each of those predictive probabilities. And that's another way to, to present this information to a more public audience um, and makes it more intuitive. 
Next slide. So um, the other thing that I found interesting was that there is a there's a save option in SPSS that you can use that you can actually generate the predicted probabilities for each observation and the group membership for each observation. And I provided the SPSS syntax here um, to do that. Um, as you see, the the syntax. I'm sorry, there was bullets added here. I didn't mean to to do that. Um, it's a logistic regression. Uh, it's the same model. You're just adding the save. Uh, PRED for predictive probabilities and P group for the membership group. And um, if you see on the next slide, the windows for this, thanks Dan. Um, so you just hit save and then you can select the probabilities and group membership. Um, another helpful series of videos that I found is a gentleman who walks through the actual math behind how um, SPSS is actually calculating those individual observations. And um, I encourage you to take a look at that. It's actually in three parts, but it's queued up to play one part after another. It wouldn't take more than 15 minutes of your time, but I think it would be very helpful to understand um, the math behind the, the process. Next slide. Uh, personally, as I mentioned, I actually prefer to do these types of analyses and stata. Um, they have these some fabulous uh, add-ons that are free that there's folks that are that have been working in SATA for a long time um, that they provide free uh, ADO or add-on files, including um, those for predictive probabilities called PR value or PR change, looking allowing you to, to see in a, a very straightforward table um, the values that change when you go from treatment to control, I'm sorry, from control to treatment conditions. Um, However, there's been some more recent work in, in uh, STATA 9 and actually um, particularly in STATA 11, I think, was when they actually started doing this more, um, and now they're up to STATA 14. But there is a um, wonderful article, PowerPoint presentation, if you will, uh, by Mr. Dr. Williams at the University of Notre Dame. Um, and I put a link here to that presentation. And it really helps you sort of see that margins, um, which are better predictors than just flat out predictive probabilities, um, they actually have the syntax to allow you to calculate um, not only um, the overall probability of, of an occurrence, but you can actually include, like, if you had a continuous variable, you could say provide the, the probabilities for everyone who is, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years old, that sort of thing. And so then it'll come out in your in your output, and it's um, quite nice. Um, the, as I said, the PowerPoint presentation is probably a PDF file, actually, um, is available on that link. At this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Dan and, and um, to finish this up. Thank you. OK, very briefly here. Um, so to kind of wrap up and conclude, you know, we're often asked to uh, report on, on, on these zero, one, yes, no questions. Uh, it's, it, it comes up uh, in policy planning, uh, in, in, in annual reports, and lots of other places where people need to know these things. Um, so the combined tools we think of logistic regression and predicted probabilities are very useful uh, to, to, to answer these questions. Um, and again, the, the data and analysis are not that difficult. Uh, these, these are reasonably simple to get the numbers. Um, but we encourage people to, to, to study this presentation uh, and, and, and to kind of play with things and use the resources um, available to you so, so that you're sure you're, in, you're, you're, you're reporting um, uh, these, these in, in ways that are good for general audiences. Uh, and, uh, and and can be properly uh, properly digested by them. A uh, couple concluding comments. The first thing we we want to point out uh, is you know you're not alone. You're you know I'm lucky. I work in an academic community. Um, I can walk down the hall at my shop and and and, and throw a dart and hit a statistician. Um, you know, but but you, you, the statisticians are available. Your colleagues are are your best resources. Um, to bounce ideas off, to show output to, to talk about, um, you know, and uh, increasingly uh, we live in in, a, in an era of researcher part practitioner uh, partnerships. So if you're if you're not tied into a local university, 
um, then uh, I strongly encourage you uh, uh, to ju try to make those links. And if you are at a university, um, you know, your colleagues in criminal justice settings uh, are, are out there and eager to work with you. Um, you gotta, all you got to do is ask. Um, so, and, and I do want to say, you know, Google has really, really, really uh, changed the world. We all know that. Uh, but I have found that, you know, I can type a syntax question into Google and get a pretty good answer. Um, and, and, and so don't be afraid to use those things. As, as Sean pointed out, too, increasingly statistics professors uh, and others have put little YouTube videos up on, on, on how to interpret things and how to do things. Don't be afraid to use those. Um, you know, reach out to people uh, via email. Um, we're doing we're doing a dangerous thing here. We're putting our emails right on this thing. Don't be afraid to reach out to us. We're around. Um, if you have questions, uh, I'm happy to look at uh, look at slides or look at syntax and things like that. And provide assistance when I can. Um, so so don't feel as though you're alone. Uh, you know, no statistician in in academia is alone. We rely on our colleagues and uh, and and people in the. The, the community practitioners, you should you, you should as well. Um, and so I, what we want to do is thank you. We're going to open this up for questions then. Uh, I'm not sure if Aaron's going to say, well, actually, I'll handle yeah. the first question. Uh, Lisa asked the question. Um, where and On one of the slides, we rounded to 3.2. Uh, Lisa at, at, uh, pointed out uh, that if you do the math, it was 3.289. So yes, we should actually round to 3.3. Uh, because uh, we always want to round up and, and, and keep those as, as best as we can. Okay, great. Any other questions? Let's see, while we're while we're waiting, you know, if anybody's typing in, we're gonna launch the um, the end of webinar uh, um, questionnaire so you guys can take a few minutes to fill that out. We would great, greatly appreciate the feedback. Um, and then we'll keep an eye on um, any questions that come in. And I would like to thank Dan and Sean and everybody for joining us today. And we hope that you enjoyed today's presentation and will join us um, in the future for uh, additional webinars, skill building webinars. We have a, um, a few coming up and uh, so uh, keep a lookout for those. They should be tentatively scheduled and listed on our JRSA webpage. Um, and thank you. And we'll fill out the questions, and then we'll see if we have any um, questions about the webinar. I'm not seeing uh, questions popping up here, so we were either so perfectly clear that uh, everybody knows what they're doing, or we confused everybody so badly that uh, they're not even asking questions. Uh, but what I would, in the interim, like to do is, uh, you know, when these materials are posted, uh, we're going to post the data set that, 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 that produced all of the tables in this report. Uh, so we encourage you to uh, pull that data set down. Uh, and, and kind of walk through these models with the tables, uh, and uh, hopefully that can be useful to you. And, uh, Hi. Hey, Dan. Yeah. There is one question. It's really a rounding question. Um, it says, would you say 3.2 or round a 3.3 since the inverse result was 3.289? I would round up. I'm not sure why I didn't, but, but, but you should round that up, yes. Okay. The other thing is somebody else asked about the use of the term negative odds ratio. Um, I think um, I think they stated in reality odds ratios are never negative, but the value of B can be negative. I think they were just um, um, – uh, is that your perspective as well? Yeah. Actually, yeah. The, 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 on the beta in the model can be negative less than zero, which will produce an odds ratio of less than one. So yeah, the negative. When I say negative, I mean less than one in an odds ratio. That's just kind of how I how I do it in my own head. But uh, no, they're not. They're not technically negative. They're less than one. 
Okay, uh, Aaron is going to, um, yeah, there's new questions on the chat. Hang on a second. Um, I think, hi, I think there was just a question about the links, and um, I may have been um, hopping back and forth, and so um, somebody was asking if the links would be posted. And there's a nod. Okay, so yes, the links will be posted. Okay, great. Well, if we don't have any other questions, then uh, then that is it. Thank you so much, everybody. If you know, if a question comes to mind, um, you know, Dan and Sean are wonderful people, and I'm sure that they will uh, respond promptly, putting them on the spot as I love to do. So, uh, all right. Well, take care and have a nice afternoon. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you.